Gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Digital Academy, Protestantism between nationalism and cosmopolitanism. Um, I think we should wait a few minutes. Maybe there will be some more participants that will join us this evening. Um, we wanted to start it. 6 p.m. Well, five minutes over time. Um, I think we can wait two minutes more. Well, but you're all there, and I think then we can start now. <laughs> um, my name is Volkmar Ortmann. I'm second chair of the Evangelischer Bund Hessen, the Protestant League in Hess. I'm minister of the Protestant Church of Kurhessen Waldeck and lecturer in church history at the uh, Justus Liebig Universität in Gießen. Um, tonight I will serve as moderator in this lecture. And I'd like to welcome you, not only in the name of the Protestant League Hessen, but also um, in the name of our partners who uh, had joined us to make this Digital Academy come real. This uh, is the communion of Protestant churches in Vienna and the Center for Protestant Theology in Eastern Europe in Sibiu, Romania. And I'd like to introduce uh, the people who had worked together to make the, con the um, Digital Academy program. This, um, most of them are among us. Um, I'd like to name them. This uh, Stefan Kosovo-Aba and Gerhard Zawatsu stepner from SETO, Oliver Engelhardt and Marco Sutter from the CPCE. Miriam Sauer, Elisabeth Engler-Stark, Beate Lührmann, Marcel Kehr and Hans Gente uh, from the Protestant League. Today we start the Digital Academy and um, I come from Germany and in Germany all lectures start with them Vorbemerkungen. Um, that's now uh, the time for Vorbemerkungen. Um, as you may have seen, the Digital Academy will have seven lectures um, and will look and examine different aspects of the topic Protestantism between nationalism and cosmopolitanism. The individual lectures will have individual forms, lectures, discussions, small groups, and bigger groups, and so on. That depends on the topic of the single lectures. Today, we will have two lectures, and uh, afterwards, we will have time to discuss what has been said. Um, I'd like to beg you to write your name 
um, in your real name uh, so that we can see who you are. And if it's possible, uh, it would be nice if you would use your camera, then we will have the chance to see you and then we uh, have another impression of the whole group, which is um, international from different countries in Europe. Um, I also beg you to mute your microphone. If you like to say something, you can use the chat or you can raise uh, the hand and then we'll make it possible to discuss. Um, I'd like to inform you as well that we want to record the lecture and um, we would like to document the lectures and the discussion and make them available on our homepage. And so I'd like to ask if there is anybody here who has an objection against this proceeding and this recording. Thank you very much that you all that you agree. Um, so I can say something about the idea. Um, the Evangelische Bund Hessen um, is an association to um, promote theological education and the knowledge of different Christian denominations and ecumenical understanding. And therefore, we had the idea to try and to establish an independent network between churches, university, and all people who are interested in questions of cooperating in Europe. Um, and therefore, we were very lucky to have the CPCE and the CETO as partners for this project. We are also lucky that we could get support of the European Union and their program Erasmus Plus. And in this lecture, we will look at different aspects of the topic Protestantism and the relationship to the nations on one hand and the goal of Christian faith, which is transnational or cosmopolitic. We have to realize that at the moment, many things are in motion in that um, Europe is more and more shaped by nationalist positions. And this has not only an impact on political debates, but on the churches as well. And therefore we will look where are the challenges of Protestant churches as agents in these changing societies and how Protestant churches can deal with the fact that they are um, based on national politics on one hand and have um, the idea of transnational cooperation and wanted to uh, foster ecumenical um, network. So tonight we will 
look at the aspect um, church and identity, local congregation, national church, Europe, theological and sociological aspects. And uh, we are very glad that we have two wonderful lecturers. And so I'd like to welcome Dr. Mario Fischer and Lukas David Meyer, who will present their papers today. The first lecture uh, will be given by Mario Fischer, and I'd like to introduce him a few words. He studied theology, uh, as far as I know, Protestant theology and Roman Catholic theology together, philosophy as well in Mainz, Marburg, Rome, and Munich. And he passed his theological exams at the Protestant Church of Hessen and Nassau. Um, we know each other since our time together in the executive committee of the Evangelische Bund in Hessen. In 2012, he was awarded his doctorate with a thesis on the significance of religious experience in the phenomenology of early Heidegger. That was a doctorate which he did at, with a, a Roman Catholic um, surveyor. And during his time in training for the ministry, he already has worked a year at the office of the community of Protestant churches in Europe, in Vienna, in Vienna, and then he was minister in Hessen. And then in 2015, he returned to the CPCE, first as office manager, and then in February 2018, the Council of the Community of Protestant Churches in Europe appointed him as the first full-time general secretary. You will, um, if you look at this um, text he published, there are many um, texts concerning theological um, fundaments of the church, for example, the Entdeckung des Trinitarischen Grundes der Kirche in der Ökumenischen Bewegung. He's worked on the Carta Ökumenica and um, he looked at the Grenzen der Einheitlichkeit und Vielfalt, limits in unity or um, in diversity, ecclesia, ecclesial plurality, plurality in Europe as a challenge and opportunity for ecumenism using the example of the CPC. Therefore, he is the best person to start the lecture with um, the point of view to look at the theological um, basics church in the plurality and the um, for identity is based on. And so I think, Mario, if you would be so kind to start your lecture. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'm very much impressed by the number of participants we have today. And I'm glad to see you or raise some faces which I knew from earlier times. Wonderful, nice to meet you this evening and I hope we have also the opportunity to come into discussion um, later on. I will share my screen and, oh wait, no, this is not sharing. I will share my screen. So I was asked to speak about church and identities this evening 
and to give you a first input to this topic. And it doesn't continue. I have to stop again. Sorry. Try it again. Yeah, now it works. Okay, well, I will have two parts of my input. First, I will speak about church and identity and especially about the document of the CPCE from the year 2001, Church, People, State, Nation, a document that was produced by the Southeastern European Regional Group of the CPCE. And secondly, I will speak about the next coming lectures and how the issue of presentism between nationalism and cosmopolitanism is treated in this digital academy. So let's start for the first part, church and identity and church, people, state, nation. The first question is who or what is the church and how is it related to forms of community like people, like state, nation, or like Europe? What is the church? If you would ask a child, then it will be clear that he will say or she will say, the church is in the, the church building next to me. It's the building with a steeple, church bells, an organ. If you would ask maybe a theologian, he or she would uh, tell us that the church is the communion of saints, the eschatological foretaste of the kingdom of God in his earthly world, or anything which is not as concrete, not as visible, as a church building. And if we ask normal people on the street, we will hear probably the church is an institution. Maybe it's rich, it's with power, and it's an institution which is losing members. Churches create fellowship. Churches create communion and relationships. And however, these relationships do not exist in a blank world, in a world without relations. People already live in many relationships, in the, within their family, within their job, in a village or town, a nation, a state, a county, whatever. They live in different languages and different cultures. And when I come to the church, and especially about churches in Europe, we have to be aware what are the numbers of them. We are just 40 million Protestants of the mainline churches in Europe. If you realize that we have a population of 500 million people in Europe and just 40 million of those are Protestants, then only 8% of all the Europeans are Protestants. And if we then realize that 20 million of these 40 million Protestants live in Germany, then we can see that Protestantism is really a minority phenomenon in Europe. The average 3% of the people of the population in Europe is Protestant. And therefore, we have minority churches, majority churches, churches with a strong connection to the state, strong connection to the nation, and also with um, less connections to anything which is organized on this official level. In its relationship to people and culture, state and nation, Protestantism evidences two different approaches. It was important to the reformers that everyone should be able to hear and understand the gospel in their own languages. Thus, on the one hand, the reformation and the development of the language and culture of the people were linked from the very beginning. Churches came into existence which were at home in peoples and cultures and vice versa. Peoples and cultures were influenced by churches. National languages developed in contrast to the universal use of Latin. There was conscious emphasis on the language of, these, of the people and of the peoples, which was also used in poetry, in minstrels, troubadours, trouvères, 
from the very beginning, the Reformation was always concerned to translate the scriptures into people's language. Each person had to be able to read the Bible independently. And in Reformation ages, sermons were given, hymns of praise to God were sung, and prayers were offered in the national languages. So a strong relationship to peoples. On the other hand, the Reformation was a movement which transcended borders and countries. You can see the, as evidence the extensive correspondence of reform, reformers like Bullinger. He has the most letters he said. So the bi biography of his letters, I think these are 18 volumes at the moment, 18 volumes of letters. Then not, and also Melanchthon and Calvin had to let, send letters all over Europe, all over the known world or Christian world of this period. Bible translations were often published abroad. That's, I think, very, a very interesting point. The first Reformation English New Testament, translated by William Tyndall, was not published in England. It was forbidden to be published in England, and therefore it was published in Worms, in Germany, at the print shop of Peter Schoeffer. You know maybe the name because it's a famous white beer, Schoefferhofer. It was the print shop of Peter Schoeffer. Or the first Slovenian Bible translate, translated by Primus Struber, was published not in Slovenia, but published in Klagenfurt, Corinthia, Austria. Primus Struber is still visible at the Euro coins of Slovenia because he formed the Slovenian language. And especially in territories where the Reformation was persecuted, people had strong international networks. So on the one hand side, the Reformation linked to the people. And on the other hand side, the Reformation as a European wide network with connections and links through families, also through weddings. We can see that a lot of um, reformers wed um, married people from other cities, towns, and they, they found a network by their marriages. And for some na nations, the church was the main place to conserve their language and their identity. If we look to different um, nations or people who haven't their own state in the years after Reformation, often it was the church that um, conserved the language and the identity of these nations. For instance, the Polish people. Um, Poland was divided into, diff to, into different countries. It was the Catholic church that was the main input. Um, player and it was clear being Polish meant being Catholic and vice versa. And today it's a big problem, for instance, for our um, Lutheran and Reformed sisters and brothers in Poland that often they were not seen as Polish people. The same happened in Greece, where they are being Greek and Orthodox seems a, a unity that is not dividable. And for people from this church, from Greece who are becoming members of another denomination, it's very hard because they're not seen as real Greek people. And we can see it on the other hand side for Hungarians after Trianon and Hungary, the Hungarian people lived in different countries, then also their the reformed um, denomination or confession became an identity marker so that it became clear if someone in Slovakia, someone in Serbia is re reformed and it's probably also a Hungarian speaking people, person. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, various states that had formerly belonged to the Warsaw Pact were able to experience national freedom again or for the first time. 
the South and Southeast Europe group, a regional group of the CPCE, the Communion of Protestant and Church in Europe, started in the mid 90s to reflect on these topics. When this regional group embarked upon the doctrinal conversation on the topic church, people, state, nation, the wars, the wars of the Balkan conflict were still ragging at full force and killing people day by day. The hope of never again war on European soil attached to the European unification process had not been fulfilled. While the EU, the European Union has been able to maintain peace within its borders for decades and to this day, war did break out on European soil right on its doorstep, right on the doorstep of the EU. National, national, nationalism had spawned violence. It was therefore important for this regional group on whose territory do this, war, this war between ethnicities, peoples and states was wrecking to examine, to examine the understanding of church, nationality and state together with the relationship of the church to these dimensions. The extent became evident to which conflicts in Europe to this day continue to stem from historically determined borders, the overriding concept of the nation state, and the fact that the territories of most nations are not aligned with the corresponding state borders. Churches are often embroiled in the, con the conflicts based on their particular Clearly close historical ties of specific nations or ethnic groups. Thus, in many areas, confessional allegiance serves precisely, precisely as a distinguishing feature that draws the demarcation line between the different ethnic groups. But what I already said, you can see as an identity marker, for instance, in Southeastern European countries, if someone is reformed, then they probably Hungarian. If someone is Lutheran, then maybe Slovakian or German speaking. As a result, it can seem to outside observers as if certain ethnic conflicts stem from confessional or religious differences. As an example, we all know about the conflict in Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland. We see already the distinctive um, perception from the Republic of Ireland or from the United Kingdom. In this conflict, we normally speak about a conflict between Protestants and Catholics. But this is not really true. When we speak about Pro Protestants, these are the pro-British royalists. And we speak about Catholics, it means these are the Irish people that are Republic Republicans in which who fight for a free Republic of Ireland. Our member churches in Ireland, the Presbyterian Church of Ireland and also the Methodist Church in Ireland are not Protestants. They are not seen as Protestants in this way because in the traditional way of patterns in the UK, there are dissenters. But the Protestants in Ireland in the conflict of Ireland are the Anglicans who are pro-British and royalists. And if we Look to England. There, the Anglicans wouldn't say they are Protestants. In England, the Anglicans describe themselves as Catholic National Church, not as Protestant, but as the Catholic National Church, the Anglican Church in Great Britain. And the same is in the Yugoslavian wars. Often, it was only said the Kosovo, uh, the Muslims, or the Orthodox, or the Catholics fought. So was clear the Kosovo Albanians were the Muslims, the Serbians, the Orthodox, the Croatians, the Catholics. But it was not a fight really between these religious communions or communities, but from different ethnic ethnic backgrounds and also languages. And it was a conflict that arose centuries before. This book, Church, People, State, Nation, was published in 2002. And after some years, it became a slow seller. Uh, the English people used a nice word, a shelf warmer. So it was standing just on the shelf and warmed the shelves. With the expansion of the EU towards East in 2004 and 2007, 
and also in 2013 with Croatia, these, these issues were not on the top of the agenda, issues of nationality of people, states. However, six years ago, with the rising of national populist parties in many European countries and with the Brexit process, boosted demand for the short text entitled Church, People, State, Nation, published by CPC in 2002. The resurgence of nationalism in Europe has also brought the critical examination of the concepts of nationality, nation and state back onto the agenda. As a result, stops of the original print run of the study expired and leading the CPC to publish a new edition in 2018. And it was very much used in Great Britain where they didn't know the concept of a nation or a state which has not natural borders. So Great Britain was an island and therefore they had no always national borders. They were not able to understand that, especially in Middle European or Eastern European countries, the borders changed during the last centuries or even in the last century many, many times. So what is the content of the study? The study first deals with people and clears, it clarifies that people normally are groups united behind a military leader. So in the history, people were just human beings who gathered together behind someone who was a force, who, a person who was able to protect, to protect them. And on the other hand side, people were often used as an antipode of the political allied or elite. So that means we speak about the elite and the people, or the government and the people. So these two ways of speaking about people we normally use in our languages. And this study has also a big um, overview about um, the use of languages, so a multilingual glossary on the concepts of people, state, and nation. So it's written in German, in English, in French, in Italian, Polish, Czech, Hungarian. Yeah, these are the languages to give an overview about the concepts in these different languages about people, state, nation. The second dimension is nation. And when we speak about nation, the nation as we use it today was a, as a phenomenon that did not become a key term in Europe until the 18th century. So we know that um, when we hear about the nations who struggled to get in um, Prague at the, with Jan Hus, so it was clear that the nations were the language groups. But today, when we speak about nations, we speak about mostly about three different concepts. Firstly, about people or ethnic groups with a common language, a common culture, history, people who are living in a defined area or state. So that is the concept of a national state. Secondly, we speak about also people or ethnic groups with a common language, cultural history. We are not tied to the limits of a territorial state. In this way we can speak about the Armenian nation who spread over the world, about the Hungarian nation who lives in different countries, or also about Germany until 1870, 1871, when it was united, or also Italy when it was united in 1870. And the third concept of nation is a concept which we maybe see in um, Switzerland, but also in other countries like in Indonesia or so that it's just the citizens of a state, irrespective of their ethnic origin, uh, the citizens who are acting together um, 
and who are bound together in a common organization, irrespective of their ethnic origin. Yeah. Last, that's the state. According to the modern understanding, the state is the, is, is the established political order which regulates the common life of citizens and society for a particular territory. So the state is connected to the territory and it's an organization with power that is able to regulate the common life of the citizens in a society. So that's just how it was as a working definition used in this document. And on the other hand side, the document said that um, the um, concept that is very useful for all of this is society. Society as the guiding perspective opens up a framework of awareness, which should be taken into account for the understanding of people, nation, and state, but also for the understanding of church. So in 2001, when this was published for some churches, this was a new approach to see the church as a part of society. Because society was not, you cannot touch society as easy as a state. And this is concept of society was also different um, discussed in Western Europe and Eastern Europe before the Iron Curtain. It was a main concept in the 1970s. But that the churches understand themselves as part of the society that became new and was also important for the development of the theology of diaspora. When um, especially minority churches understand them, stood themselves not only as minority, so regarding the numbers, the small numbers, but as diaspora, so that as a seed sown into the soil, in the soil of the nation, in the soil of the state, of the society. And in these diasporas, these diaspora churches need always um, partners in their on their local level, on their national level, because they have no um, um, privileges. They have no privileges because they are the biggest um, employer in the town, the big diaconia, but because, just because they have good arguments and they find for every topic other partners to safeguard a process, to lobby another process. And on the other hand, these Diaspora churches were interconnected with a lot of international churches. They are connected to churches abroad always because they need the exchange of pastors, they need the exchange of pastoral training, of education, of theological discourse. And this was published in 2018, the Theology of Diaspora, which I recommend to you also. The community, uh, the communion of Protestant Church in Europe um, derives from the Leuenberg Agreement. In 1973, all the 109 churches that signed the Leuenberg Agreement became members of the communion of Protestant Churches in Europe. And the approach of the Leuenberg Agreement was unity and reconciled diversity, that every church remains autonomous, that the condemnations of the Reformation age and the hatred between churches in especially the Thirty Years' War, became reconciled by theological work, but also by um, common witness and service to the world and in this world. And at the end, we work as a common communion, as a common, as a joint community. Regarding the relationship, and we can use this also to an approach of the churches, how they deal with other questions where they are still unreconciled. Questions of nationalism and divorce from earlier states. 
uh, earlier times. Regarding the relationship to people, state, and nation, a historical review makes it clear that Protestantism in Europe can be seen as a movement with two faces. It has undeniable deep roots in the language, culture, and history of the people. It is firmly anchored in its national identity and often in a particular state structure as well. It, in this way, it has influenced the state, but also been influenced by it. There is no intention to deny or trivialize this diversity of states, nations, churches. On the contrary, it contributes to the wealth of the Euro Reformation churches, but it points at the same time to their danger, their particular cultural, territorial, and often also national characteristics have often hindered to understand and cooperate with other confessions or cultures. The ecumenical movement of the past century has contributed to a considerable broadening of the horizon at this point. In the conciliar process for justice, peace, and the integrity of creation, the churches recognized responsibility for the world as their common task. The Europe of today, with the institution of the European Union, the Council of Europe, etc., etc., is a relatively new subject for European Protestantism. It is possible to refuse to deal with it because of its complexity and unmanageableness. Unmanageableness, you know. But, this, but since Protestantism in its history was fundamentally open to the world, the Leuenberg Fellowship continued to be concerned about Europe and took up the challenge further to develop Protestant traditions of a living and liberating experience of God in the context of the European integration process. And the General Assembly of the Leuenberg Church Fellowship in Belfast 2001 spoke about the Protestant voice in Europe. And then in 2003, consequently, the Leuenberg Church Fellowship changed its name to the community or communion of Protestant churches in Europe. Europe as the place where God has sent us, where we have to act as our, in our task. Yeah. The CPCE builds on grateful awareness of the church's own traditions and developing these further on examining ambiguities. Having common experiences and interpret, interpreting these in the light of the gospel. A special link between language, culture, and religion requires Protestantism to give careful attention to and jointly to grapple with all the problems resulting from it. For instance, linguistic conflicts and minority issues in European states. Now, just a short point how the issue Protestantism between nationalism and cosmopolitanism is treated in this digital academy, how it comes into life. Next, now we will hear after my input also a lecture by Lucas David Meyer, but the second lecture will be given on 18th of November on the variety of Christian identities and ecumenical perspectives given by Stefan Tobler and Marius Christian. And I think we'll hear here about the Romanian context about the Orthodox Reformed Lutherans in Romania, how there are different cultures, different languages, and different identities, and how they live together in one state, but also how they try to work on the ecumenical level and where it's possible and if it's possible. If a common um, national, if a common state brings also the churches together, or if it's also a hindrance to ecumenical work of the churches. Third lecture will be given by Peter Moray, professor in Prague, about the present churches under the influence of nationalism. And he will give historical examples. I think it's interesting that it's called under the influence of nationalism. We can, so we can see that often he also we could see that churches were the ones who influenced nationalism. And they started with unholy alliances with different national states. The fourth lecture 
given by Stefan Kosoraba, also from the CETO and CBU. And his topic is the question of one church and the plurality of languages and ethnicities. So especially in Transylvania, it's a historical question, but it's still a question of today. So I already mentioned, if we hear someone's reformed, he's maybe Hungarian. If we hear someone is Lutheran, he's maybe Slovakian or German. Catholic, that means in Southeastern European countries, Hungarian or Croatian and Orthodox in Romania will be the Romanians, traditional Romanians. Some times we have also different ethnicities, eth ethnicities and languages within the same church. And there it becomes interesting. If churches use different languages, if churches are the ones who are able to bring together people from different languages and nations, then it has also an impact on their liturgy. They have to use the different languages in weddings, in baptisms, in the regular Sunday service. And often the pastors, I spoke with Gerhard Zerwarz and Steppner last week, and he told me often he doesn't know when he goes to the pulpit whether he should preach in Romanian or in German. And then he looks to the people and decides instantaneously. And these questions become more and more vivid when it comes to current questions of migration. And there we will have Anna Zell and Shari Brown. Anna Zell is pastor of the Valdensian Church in Como, and the Valdensian Church has established a special model which is called Estra Chiesa in Siena, being church together. And their migrants, especially coming from Africa, are integrated in the normal church life. So it can happen. The Valdensian Church is a minor minority church with around about 30,000 members all over Italy. And in some congregations, you have maybe 80 older women and 200 people coming from Ghana and Nigeria. This has a huge impact to these congregations. And some people don't feel at home in their own congregation anymore. So that's the question that's discussed in the um, Valdensian church since 20 years. And you can also observe a backlash especially on conservatism. The um, Valdensian church was one of churches early started to bless um, homosexual couples. And, with the, and also it ordained people, women from the early 50s. And then with um, um, church members coming from Africa, they had this backlash that they denied having female pastors and that they don't accept the um, same sex blessings. The sixth lecture will be on historical continuity, new beginnings, and the reformation of Protestant identity. And here we have people um, Anton Tichomira from St. Petersburg, Raphael Kwan from Munich, and Nicole Krokovina, who are all working with the um, Elgras, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Russia and the other states, so from the Soviet Union without except of the Baltic states. And here we can see that um, in the Lutheran Church in um, Russia and the other states of the former year, um, Soviet Union was a German-speaking church. But the, the language changed a lot, especially when under Stalin and the Germans were um, forced, had the forced migration to Siberia or Kazakhstan. So a lot of them lost their German language and only learned Russian. And then they came back to, for instance, Georgia. And the church started then to speak German and, and Russian. But the younger generation didn't learn Russian anymore after the fall of the Iron Curtain, but it's because they learned in Georgia, Georgian. And they speak Georgian and they learned English at school. So there's no connection with being the older generation and the younger generation because they speak different languages. It's a question how it's also 
then done with this four languages and services. And then at the end, there will be a summary and outlook with a podium and plenary discussion. Thank you very much that you had, that you spent so much time with me now. And I hope that we come also to discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mario, for your lecture and the introduction in the Digital Academy as um, a whole. Um, as we will see at the end, I have a little correction to, correction to make because we first um, had the idea to um, discuss in the second lecture the situation in Romania, but unfortunately, um, none of the Romanian Orthodox Church was able to take part on the Digital Academy, so we had to look for something, somebody else, and we uh, are lucky that we have found Katarina Pekridu from Brussels. She's Greek uh, Orthodox, and she works for the community, uh, for, for the Conference of European Churches in Brussels, and she will join us uh, next time. Um, but uh, now we turn over to the second lecture, and therefore I'd like to introduce Lukas Meyer, who is research assistant at the chair of systematic theology in Munich. Um, but that is not all what is uh, to say about him. Um, he served a voluntary year of social service in Sarajevo after he finished, finished school. And there, during this year, he became deeply aware of Europe as an important topic to think about and to be engaged with, he said. He studied theology, philosophy, and economics in Göttingen, Bayreuth, and Rome. And in 2030, he got the Young European of the Year Award for commitment to a European Social Day and served an internship with a lawmaker at the European Parliament. So therefore he is very um, committed to Europe and very interested in Europe. Um, this led him to his dissertation project with the title in German, Öffentliches Christentum im europäischen Ernstfall, ein Vergleich kirchlicher Europamodelle aus sozialethischer Perspektive, Public Christianity in European Seriousness, Comparison of Church Models of Europe from a Social Ethical um, Perspective. And in this context of his dissertation project, he also published a number of articles, um, for example, Abendland and Apokalypse, and he writes about an ecumeny of hatred. And um, then he um, looked at the conflict between right-wing populism and Christian churches, and um, he even worked on the Carta Ecumenica with the title Honestly Striving Contemporary European Political Challenges and the Carta Ecumenica in the Crisis of Credibility. So he is the person to give us insights of the connex between confessional um, orientation and the different models that comes from this different confessional traditions as he writes the different models of Europe. And um, he has um, 
I think for me a fascinating sentence about what he um, is so fascinated about Europe. And he says, what fascinates me about Europe apart from its diversity is its contribution to pacification. For me, Europe and theology belong together. This, the disarmament of nationalistic and confessionalistic aberrations and the joint shaping of the European project are therefore an important concern for me as a Christian and a citizen. Um, I think this is um, a good headline for our digital academy, for our goal, what we want to look at, um, to look at the nationalistic and conf confes confessionalistic aberrations, which may be um, um, Missing the word, <laughs> which may um, um, ah, sorry, I don't find, find a word, but uh, which um, may hinder the the forthcoming of Europe as an an idea and a room of working together. And today, um, Lukas Meyer will focus on aspects in how far the notion and especially the model of Europe varies between the different confessions. And now, Mr. Meyer, on the left, um, you will show us and tell us your um, examples and the differences you have found out. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to share my screen very soon. Um, just before uh, my presentation, uh, short comment about the, the publication. So. Uh, my PhD project will be published in German next year, um, I hope in the beginning of the year, um, and uh, I'm now also talking with uh, some colleagues from Scotland, um, and maybe it will be published in English too uh, next year. This is what I hope, um, but I will share also my presentation so you, uh, you can have that for sure, and um, if you're uh, interested in uh, what the the more detailed uh, parts and the quotes as well, um, I, I hope to, to be able to, to show that soon. So um, when starting uh, or before starting, um, uh, a short uh, uh, reference to the, to the title, so Church and Identity, Local Congregation, National Church in Europe. And um, I decided to turn it the other way around. So I, uh, I am going to start with Europe um, then I will come to national church identities. And my conclusion is basically act local, think global, or at least European. Um, so I, I'm turning it all the way around. When I talk about Europe, uh, I'm referring uh, to the European Union pretty close, um, which is not um, a matter of fact in ecumenical discussions about Europe. So what is very um, widespread is uh, to, to say, okay, when we talk about Europe, we, we aren't uh, so close to the European Union um, because Europe is a lot more, which is very understandable if you want to include um, especially uh, confessional traditions that are not a part of the European Union. However, the European Union is a fact and um, it uh, is, uh, well, it has a very, very big influence towards all of us. Um, so I think um, it's it's important also to stress uh, this uh, this fact, whether you like it or not. I mean, you you can be critical about the European Union. Um, I am not that critical about it because I see uh, many of positive aspects when it comes to reconciliation, and uh, when it comes to reconciliation, I see also um, a huge um, common ground between Christian 
faith and uh, the European unification. Um, but uh, also if you leave all the normative uh, stand on Europe out, so if, if you leave out all, all what you personally um, and politically believe about Europe, you, you have to admit it is a fact and it um, is influencing us um, very much. So let's start with uh, Europe and the European Union. And um, I'm going back to the beginning. I, before presenting it, I check it all. So there we go. So my first um, reference to the European Union is um, also a reference to a, to a book, Passage to Europe by uh, Luke Middelar. Uh, he's a Dutch uh, historian. And um, his uh, idea or his concept in Passage to Europe, a very insightful book um, published first time in 2011, I think, um, is that there is a strong Europeanization since 1989. So uh, when the Iron Curtain fall down, um, East and West were in the move and um, the European Union, as we know it today and as we see it in the news every day, um, is very, very influenced by these dynamics um, around uh, the year 89, um, where I was, when I was born, actually. Um, so you see, even though I was awarded as a young European, I'm not such a young European anymore. Um, but that's another story. Um, and uh, two very um, central treaties uh, for this Europeanization uh, are, uh, first, the Treaty of Maastricht in 92, um, and second, the Treaty of Lisbon. So these are very important uh, treaties. I will not get into the detail. I mean, there are scholars and scientists who dedicate their whole life to one of those treaties. Um, but what you can say, um, there, there are um, the, the, the important pillars of the European Union, as we see it today, were formed in these treaties mainly. Um, so the Schengen Room, um, which shapes also our migration policy because, because we have a common um, European travel uh, space, uh, so we have to organize it somehow and we have to agree um, on migration policy, um, or um, the Euro, uh, the strengthening of the European Parliament, many, many important steps for uh, the European Union were shaped in those treaties. And um, what Middlar also um, stresses is that there is a turn from rule politics to event politics. Um, you might not be familiar with rule politics and event politics. Um, basically, the idea is that rule politics is uh, technocracy. And the European Union until 89 was a very, very technocratic uh, project. Um, still, there is uh, this, uh, this very negative image of the European Union that uh, was very present, for instance, in the Brexit debate. So um, this monster Brussels with all those technocrats who don't care anymore about the local and national uh, level. Um, and somehow it is true, there is something true in this critique. Um, however, uh, the development of the European Union since 89 is the other way around. Um, so it was the beginning of a political union. It wasn't simply an economical project anymore, um, but also a political project. And um, we, uh, we used to, to not appreciate that much the European Parliament, but the European Parliament is the only transnational parliament on the whole world that is elected in a direct way. So it's a very democratic institution as well. And it's actually the most transparent uh, parliament in the world as well. You can watch whatever you want about the European Parliament, um, but nobody does it, unfortunately. Um, uh, however, it is uh, something that, that is new. And with this um, diminishing of technocracy, um, more and more unexpected events uh, took place. And uh, unexpected events are, uh, or it's another phrase for, for event politics. So events are important to understand Europe. This is a um, uh, second main concept of, of Luke Middela. And um, it is visibly especially when you when you analyze the constitutional crisis so the whole debate around uh, constitutional treaty of Europe um, mainly took place from 2001 until the Treaty of Lisbon in 2009 um, there was a crisis we will get deeper to that soon um, the financial crisis since 2008 we we all uh, remember it maybe um, 
And um, it's still not completely solved, even though it is not as dramatic as it was from, um, well, may mainly 2008 to 2012, I would say. These were the most critical uh, years. And uh, third uh, crisis is the migration crisis since 2015. Um, so um, these three crises are very, very interesting to, to understand Europe in a, in a better bay, way. You might say, okay, how about climate change? This is also very important, it's true. But what is interesting about those three crises on, on constitution, finance and uh, migration is that the European Union took place in a very core way, in a very central way, in all our national uh, public sphere. So um, we started to, to reflect a lot more what is going on in other European countries and in the European Union in general um, when those crises took place as unexpected events. So this is basically what, what is my approach to, to Europe. And um, now we will focus more on the national uh, churches and um, we will focus in, in this uh, section on Protestant churches. I also worked on Catholic and Orthodox uh, churches. Um, so I'm leaving them out in, in this presentation, but um, of course they are uh, very interesting and insightful too. Um, so uh, when, when I think about churches is, um, the first question is what's their historical relation to Europe? Um, because they all have their history and uh, this history, um, well, gives a, uh, an aspect uh, or a, it, it, it turns their view in a particular way also when they refer to, to those crises I'm going to focus uh, later on. And uh, the second question is how do they act in European emergency? So European emergency is kind of my um, concept uh, to describe uh, these three crises and um, to uh, to reflect um, this emergency. So um, it, it's also my approach to say, okay, when it gets very seriously, um, then uh, Europe becomes more interesting because we talk in a more authentic way about Europe. Um, so it's not the, the Sunday sermon and the Sunday uh, speeches we used to hear so often in Germany. So we are pretty, pretty used to, to hear or to listen to those Sunday sermons about Europe that is important and so on. Um, but when a crisis takes place, um, real talk starts, and that's why um, those are interesting. So first, um, well, history, then constitutional crisis, uh, financial crisis, and then migration crisis. We will uh, jump into that and um, uh, have a short rush through um, all of them. So, and I'm comparing, um, it's uh, it's uh, election, I took um, and I'm comparing the European level, um, the community of Protestant churches in Europe um, and the German and the Hungarian um, context. Um, so it might be also very interesting to study more uh, about other minority churches, but I think what is very interesting about the German and the Hungarian context is uh, that you have the balance between East and West and um, you have uh, two bigger churches. So um, even though I'm fully aware that the Hungarian church um, or the, the Reformed Church in Hungary, which I'm referring to, uh, is not the biggest church in Hungary and that the Catholic Church is, um, has more uh, members. Um, I still consider the, the Reformed Church in Hungary as, um, uh, as a very state close church um, and is a big church too. Um, so uh, this changes somehow also the, the self image and uh, the, the importance to, to stand out um, on political events. So when starting with the community of Protestant churches in Europe, um, we, we have to say that um, a Protestant commitment, especially in the beginning of, um, of uh, the European project, so in the 50s, was mainly uh, the business of laymen. So um, church officials were pretty distant, um, which was also caused by, uh, by German distance to Europe. So even though Germans used to, um, to present themselves always as as if they were the most European uh, ever, which is not true. I'm, I'm, I think that's uh, sometimes a pretty nationalist um, approach. Um, but especially in the beginning, Protestant churchmen were pretty distant to Europe uh, because they were mainly interested in the unification of Germany. So East and West Germany was uh, the main issue, the main political issue um, for of, of foreign affairs. Uh, whereas the European 
um, unification was something they, they were a little indifferent. And ecumenical networks such as the World Council of Churches or the Conference of European Churches um, considered as well the, the European unification merely as the division between East and West. So they said it's not a good thing because the division between East and West will get deeper um, because of European Union or what was the, the pre-project. Um, the, we, we already heard by, by Mario Fischer um, the, the, something about the beginning of uh, the, the community of Protestant churches in, in Europe. Um, and in the beginning, they were um, more interested in dogmatics. So this formula, United in Diversity, was first a rather dogmatic um, formula. But then, step by step, it became also an ethical formula. Um, so around about 2000, um, the community uh, was fully aware that um, huge steps were taken. So they understood what uh, Luke Middelar also described. So European Union is becoming a political union. Um, and there something like a European public sphere is emerging. Uh, so ethical analysis has to um, uh, become more important. So uh, th th these were the years in which um, more and more uh, work was uh, was done by the community of the Protestant churches in Europe as well. Um, so uh, Germany, um, as we, we already heard, so um, more, more or less 50% of the Protestants in Europe, so 20 of those current 40 million Protestants in, in Europe, even those they, they were more Protestants in German, Germany, um, let's say in the 50s or 60s. Um, but we can say more or less the half of the Protestants in, in Europe are Germans. So um, German uh, Protestantism and European Protestantism are pretty closely interfered. Um, and uh, I already explained, they have this long story of uh, Protestant indifference towards Europe. And in 1990, um, they, uh, their attitude changed because of uh, European data right. So uh, European data right was challenging the German church tax system. Um, I, I hope um, all those uh, non-Germans understand somehow um, this uh, special German uh, church tax system, but it which which guarantees um, a, a very high standard of prosperity um, for for our church, also compared to other churches. And when European data right was starting to challenge that system somehow, because the data right had somehow the stance that um, that it's a private thing, uh, what, whether you're Catholic, Protestant, um, agnostic or whatever. And that was a problem for, for this church tax system. So that was the point when uh, the EKD um, uh, established an office in Brussels and uh, also improved the German Protestant reflection on Europe. Um, so it was a pure interest. It was not the, the moral commitment towards Europe to say we, we want to support this reconciliation project somehow. It was mainly we want to defend our uh, lobby, our interest. Uh, and by the way, funny story, the, um, uh, they took uh, the office of Philip Morris, so the tobacco uh, enterprise. Um, uh, th so when the tobacco enterprise said, OK, European Union, it's done. Um, we cannot sell our products anymore. Uh, German Protestantism took the place of it and said, okay, we want to defend our German tax system. So that is the historical um, uh, side of, of, of German Protestantism. And when, when it comes now to the, to the Hungarian Reformed Church, um, I think it's important maybe, um, I, I already saw several uh, Hungarian names, um, so, so I'm curious also about their uh, views, and I hope I, I, I am not um, yeah, misleading the analysis uh, here, um, but I think there uh, there is a strong national identity also in this Reformed Church, not only in the uh, in the Hungarian um, uh, mentality, and especially in reaction uh, to the Treaty of Trianon in 1920. Many other Europeans uh, do not understand this treaty so well, but it is very very important for Hungary and for the uh, Hungaro Protestant um, Church and also for many diaspora churches because they weren't united anymore in one state. Um, so in, in several other states that were partly created in the uh, Treaty of Trianon or um, in, in, in formerly uh, Hungarian soil that was 
uh, than given to, to other countries, um, they were also diaspora churches. So diaspora that now has become also a very important concept for uh, the reflection inside the community of Protestant churches in Europe um, is important uh, for, for their um, identity. And it was important also during the Cold War area and um, has continued, for instance, in the historical uh, theology by uh, Erwin Bali Naji. I hope I pronounced him right. Um, so this is, um, these might be some aspects um, historically that are interesting. And uh, when it now comes to the constitutional crisis, um, I, I studied also the statements by um, the, the, the community. And um, there you can see they are pretty reserved and pretty distant towards a reference to God or Christianity in the constitutional preamble. So maybe some of you remember this debate. It was the debate should in, in, a, in a treaty uh, on, on a European constitution, should there be in the preamble a reference to God or to Christianity or not? In the end, there was only a reference uh, to religious heritage but uh, especially Catholic Church lobbied pretty strongly for uh, for reference to, to God um, and or Christianity. Um, however, the community was pretty distant and uh, they said, we're fine how it is, um, that's okay. So you also see somehow the, um, uh, or something like a minority Protestant um, identity behind that because um, for, for let's say French or Italian, uh, Protestants, they are completely fine. They are interested in, to, in, in, a, in a laicistic and a, a separation between state and church because they suffered from the, the privileges that um, especially the Catholic Church in those contexts were guaranteed. So they say, okay, uh, a very secular European Union is totally fine for us. Um, on contrary, Germany, um, so the chairman or former chairman of the EKD, Wolfgang Huber, argued in favor of a reference um, to God. And uh, he understood it as a liberal formula of statal humility. So when a state refers in a preamble or, or a state communion like the European Union, when they refer to God in a preamble, they uh, limit themselves. Um, so um, this is uh, the, the concept and therefore European Union should respect the freedom to practice religion, so it's a positive understanding of um, freedom of religion, as a contribution to tolerance uh, in European societies. So you're not tolerant if you're not religious, you're tolerant uh, if you um, accept and appreciate religions, also difference of them. And therefore, religion should be taught in schools as well. And um, this is somehow the, the, the German way of shaped mainly by Wolfgang Huber, but it became a official position of the EKD in this uh, constitutional crisis. And when it now comes to Hungary, um, it was rather a debate from outside because you all know Hungary was not a member of the European um, Union, even though there are um, some interferences, mainly when, when it comes to the, um, to the huge uh, East enlargement uh, on the 1st of May in 2004, when Hungary became a, a European Union member too. Um, and by the way, uh, I think it's also interesting um, statistics that on the referendum that was held on the 12th of April in the same year in Hungary, 83% uh, were in favor of entering uh, the European Union and the Synod of the Reformed Church um, expressed, um, I'm quoting, the freedom in the community of people that brings us together with all our Hungarian brothers living beyond our borders. So again, you see that um, this uh, connection also to, um, to other Hungarian reformed um, uh, people that are not living on the, on the state soil of, of Hungary is, is still very important and uh, was stressed in this very short uh, statement. Uh, by the way, those reformed uh, statements are very nice to analyze because they are always very short and very clear, um, which is a good thing. Um, German Protestants tend to, to talk and talk and talk, and it's hard to analyze because you, you're asking yourself, what's the point here? Uh, whereas the reforms are very, very straight to the point, um, which is a good thing. You don't have to spend so much time on research. Um, so let's come to the, to the next um, point, financial crisis. Um, and uh, this is also very interesting, 
interesting when it comes to European uh, level because there was um, produced the first real ethical study by the community of Protestant churches, Stand Up for Justice. You can Google um, that study. It's uh, it's online on the page of the community, so you can read it as well. And what is also very interesting is that they um, decided or agreed on a bottom-up approach. So from the bottom up, from the national bottom up to to a common European position, uh, which is, for instance, a uh, um, on, on on contrast to to the Roman Catholic Church. There they have a top-down approach so um, something is produced um, from from the holy chair and um, it gets into the national context and this is on contrary the specific uh, Protestant approach so we have uh, they studied many many different um, ethical uh, studies of course mainly related to justice and to economy um, and they uh, bin it, try to bin it all together and um, uh, the, the main idea um, I mean, it's a, it's a complex study, but I would say the main idea was in financial crisis to spread the German model of social economy on a European level. So um, a strong stance towards solidarity um, in, in that uh, study. So when, when we now uh, refer to Germany, we, we see um, a difference. Uh, so there, uh, the core text is Common Responsibility for a Just Society, published in 2014, together with the Roman Catholic Church. This is also another German specific. So when, when they uh, stand up ethically, they always cooperate with the Catholic Church to make their voice heard in a better way. And uh, the German position is now a lot more reserved compared to the European position. So um, uh, they, they don't stand up that clearly for European solidarity. They rather say, well, it is important that the giving states, which in financial crisis were mainly the, the northern uh, states, even though Ireland was suffering utterly in the, uh, in the financial crisis, especially in the beginning. Um, and they try to balance it a little more with um, the responsibility of the taking states. So let's say Greece, uh, also has to take responsibility to, to get their tax income and to use those credits in a, in a rather way. So uh, a position that is more modest. Um, and uh, I talked also to some theologians um, working on that uh, text and they also said they were somehow afraid of a, of a public reaction in Germany because uh, debate was, uh, was pretty hot in those uh, years. And we must not forget that our right uh, populist party that now got established in the parliament, the AfD, um, became big in the financial crisis. They became even bigger in the migration crisis, but the financial crisis was their birth hour. Um, now, uh, compared to the, to the reformed, uh, reformed church, there is no explicit reflection. Um, so there is no, no uh, synod statement or uh, something, something similar. However, there were, and there still are, harsh problems, especially for diaconical businesses. Um, uh, so, so those from the Reformed Church. And um, in addition, I would say two events are pretty important. Um, uh, first, the uprise of Viktor Orban, a Reformed Church member. Uh, during the financial crisis. Um, so um, he uh, became as powerful as he is in, in Hungary, um, especially because also because of his politics um, in reaction to the, to the financial crisis. And in addition, the emigration of several young workers. Um, so um, I've, I've got two kids and when I go to a hospital here in, in Munich, I meet a lot of doctors from Hungary or nurses from Hungary as well. So um, this is also important to understand um, also the, the deep division in the migration politics, because um, as, uh, as it was analyzed, for instance, by, by Ivan Krastev, a Bulgarian philosopher um, in, in, in Bulgaria or Romania or Hungary or Poland, immigration and emigration are uh, reflected on the same time. Whereas in the West, uh, there, there is another perception. Of, of migration. So I think this is important also um, to reflect. And um, you, you can also see in, in those articles I read from, from the reformed sphere about the financial crisis, you, you can always, um, yeah, you get a feeling that uh, those things were 
uh, pretty, uh, pretty challenging problems for, for Hungarian society and for church as well. So now uh, the, the migration uh, crisis, um, there, uh, when it comes to the, to the European position, the community position, there is a long um, tradition of a, of a liberal migration policy. Um, so it, uh, it starts with the uh, Liebfrauenberg declaration, <coughs> sorry, in uh, two, 2004. And um, there are many, many statements um, in which the The, the community criticize Europe with Europe in a way. <coughs> so they say European law has to be implemented by, by the migration governance and um, this gets concrete with uh, safe corridors. <coughs> now, when it comes to the German position, um, it's mainly converging with, uh, with the community position. Um, so the Synod in 2016 took a similar states. Um, however, there is a rather EU skeptical sound in each. Um, <coughs> so um, the, the, I call him the, the EKD migration officer, uh, Rikowski, he said that uh, the European Union should return the Peace Nobel Award from 2012 because of its migration policy. Um, and um, the open question remains how to find a common European position. And um, as a German Protestant, I have to admit, I miss that a lot in the EKD positions, um, even though I, I understand also their stance on, on migration policy. But this dimension of finding a European compromise um, is missing out pretty often. So um, I think uh, you, or, or there you can see also that it is, uh, um, they, they are referring pretty much to the, to the national debate and um, this deep division in, in, in Europe is not reflected so, uh, so much. When it comes to Hungary, um, let's say that their, their um, material um, position is pretty on the contrary um, also to the, to the EKD. Um, there were some tangents, uh, even though I believe this, uh, this conflict never really, really arised, but um, there were some, some, some bad vibes uh, between Germany and Hungary, even though um, there, there are also strong, strong connections and uh, uh, strong partnerships. Um, and there is a statement um, that, that kind of explains these uh, tensions, <coughs> again, by the, by the Senate presidency. Um, it was on the third of September in 2015, so um, in the in the most tense part of the migration crisis. Um, I am quoting: "We also thank, uh, so we as the Reformed Church or as the presidency of of the Synod of the Reformed Church, we also thank the Euro Hungarian authorities for fulfilling their duties at the highest possible standard, despite contradictory EU directives." So there you can also get this uh, EU skeptical sound. Um, and they also refer to, to own projects. Um, so um, they, they kind of highlighted the diaconical profile. So they say we are doing um, refugees uh, projects, but they kind of downlighted uh, the policy. And they, uh, they said, we, we, we don't want to, to express so clearly our political stance. Um, so this is uh, the difference there. And this was, uh, short rush uh, through all those uh, crises. Of course, there are more and more attacks, but I tried to, to put it in a, in a very elementary way. And I think it's somehow helpful to get, get this broad horizon of, of how the churches reacted um, to, to all those crises and where there are uh, some differences. And then I, I come to, to my conclusion. So act local, think global, or at least European. Um, this might sound a bit uh, disrespectful towards the European scale. I think it's very challenging to, to uh, think European. Um, and uh, I will make this more clear with uh, three points. So um, my first point is um, we uh, have somehow, when, when we think about Europe, we have somehow weak national churches, but strong lo local congregations. 
Um, so the, the national churches, they did not reflect so much um, the importance of the European unification. Um, I already explained why uh, that happened like that. However, um, on a congregational level, there was a lot going on. So especially between East and West, there were many, many projects. And um, this is somehow interesting that on a congregational level, there was uh, activism and there was European commitment. Uh, whereas on the, on the official uh, policy state level, um, there was always this somehow uh, Protestant indifference uh, towards Europe. So a bit provocative, I, I say, with a delay of 50 years, and there I showing uh, an icon for this delay, Protestant national churches have understood Europe exists, although uh, local congregations were important for European unity. Second point, uh, national church identity remains strong. And um, I already referred a little ironically to, to the German uh, context. They consider themselves to be very European, um, even though they, they still remain somehow um, uh, yeah, in a, in, a, in a German mindset. So I, uh, I think it would be useful also to, um, yeah, to balance a little the how they get perceived by other Europeans and how they perceive themselves sometimes. Um, and uh, when, when you refer it now to, to the um, community of Protestant churches level, um, there is, I would say, at best a bottom-up approach because it's also a very young institution. So um, ethical debates always arise out of national preparation. Um, so there is not such a Catholic top-down effect. And um, I would say there's also a, just a weak convergence with, um, with the orthodox side-to-side -side effect. Um, so uh, these are the three options that are possible. Um, and uh, this is something I hope also for the future of ethical reflection in, in European Protestantism, that they um, find a stronger European voice as well. As well. Because um, yet uh, it's rather a, an interest. So also this, this formula, um, united and reconciled diversity, as beautiful as it is, it's rather being together as diverse uh, churches, as diverse nations. Whereas this, this other part, becoming one, that always has, import, has been very important, both for the ecumenical as for the European project, diminishes a little bit. Um, and you always had both also in European history. So Luke Middelar describes it that um, especially the European Parliament and the Commission, they are mainly focused in becoming one ever closer union. Whereas the, the council where all the statesmen are meeting is rather the institution with the dynamic of uh, being together as diverse states in that case. And I would say um, the, the community is still uh, rather on a council uh, dynamic. And um, this is something that uh, can grow also with the assemblies. I think the assemblies are also a part or the gatherings of, of young people in which this uh, dimension of becoming one could uh, get stronger. Um, and third point, uh, Protestant social ethics has to work harder. Um, so I think um, it, it, churches care about ethics, so they, they, there is an interest, but uh, ethicists um, care too less about the churches. This is a problem I, I feel also in my everyday work from time to time, um, because I, um, well, I kind of had, of, of, had to, to justify myself for, for my PhD project from time to time. Um, so um, in, especially in Germany, uh, many, uh, scholars prefer to yeah to to focus on on the the thirtieth work on Karl Barth or something like that, and I think it would be a lot more interesting and fruitful to uh, to discuss more um, the church uh, dynamics and to analyze that because this could be more more interesting. Um, and I also believe that local commitment also will change ethical reflection on Europe. So. You can see that also in the 90s where many assemblies were held, where a lot of dynamics were uh, going on also in the field of European uh, Protestantism, that there are more um, articles and there is more reflection because um, of course those uh, scholars sitting on their desk, um, they, they realize that and they 
um, get a feeling that this could be interesting. So these are my three points. Um, down there is my, my email. So you can email if you have any question, of course, um, or we, we can discuss now immediately. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you, for those substantial inputs. And because both lectures were so substantial, I like to ask you if there are any questions at this point. We still have about 20 minutes to go and to eight o'clock and that's a good time to ask many questions and start a discussion. If you like, you can give a sign and ask. It's quite late in the evening, I think. And <laughs> difficult to speak and ask questions. Um, as far as I could follow, I've learned um, from you, Mario, the three um, aspects of, um, yeah, nation. Uh, or people, nation, and state are three models you we have to deal with uh, when we look at the political dimension. And I um, like to say that I um, have a lot of sympathy uh, on the model of state because there are um, as you described it, citizens are um, member of a state um, irrespective uh, to their origins. That is, um, seems to become a communion and community. And um, I'd like to ask the state, I often understand as uh, opposition to this community. There are then it um, comes to the point where you have the people on one hand, one side and state on the other side. And that's why I'd like to ask if the model of a republic may be a, um, a better model than the model of a state. And I'd like to add, because in a republic, um, this more self-organizing, there's the idea of working together and having um, um, a common uh, idea and a common aim and work together. And we decide together, we vote together and um, So is this a question to me? Yes, well, maybe, but if you would like to ask, and Mr. Mike can ask, uh, answer as well, because you brought this up, this idea of state. Okay. Um, so in this document, the Church, of Church People, State, Nation, it's also mentioned that um, their concept of state belongs mostly to a democratic state. And so it's not a question of republic or monarchy this sense, but it's a question of the democratic state. Mm -hmm. And in the years when it was um, published so, or also elaborated in the late 90s and early 20, early O years, um, it was also a concept that was um, shared by all European churches. In the meantime, we had discussions about um, um, illiberate or Ill yeah, illiberate democracies and so on, 
And now we have also a um, working process about democracy in our member churches. And we can see that the understanding of democracy and of um, the um, engagement of people in the decision making of their states is not seen differently now. And therefore, we have this change. And we can also see that, especially minority churches, which lived in autocratic systems, are hesitant to share always the concept of democracy because um, they see democracy mostly as just um, ruling of the majorities because they don't know it in a way that majority, uh, democracy as a um, um, yeah, in this official states form needs always the rule of law as well um, minor, minority protection protection of um, people who are not with the majority and that, I think that is not in the main line or in the main thinking of all churches and therefore we have now this process on democracy I see also the hand of Alexander um, um, Mr. Heinle. Yeah, thank you all um, for the lectures. And yeah, I have two um, questions for understanding and thinking. Um, like one question is like what, how we define um, Protestantism like in this uh, digital course, because like um, are Anglicans also like Protestants or depend they to Protestantism or like evangelicals because there are like different um, defini definitions of yeah, Protestants. And my second question is like how the, the communion of Protestant churches in Europe are uh, like is organized, like they have kind of synod, are they civil organiz organized like the WCC or, yeah, thank you. Oh, if I understand it right, it's also a question to me. Yeah, okay, well, so when I spoke about persons, it's mainly about the member churches of the person church, the communion of Protestant churches in Europe, so about Lutherans, Reformed churches, Methodist churches, and also churches of the First Reformation, so the um, Valdensians and the Czech Brethren. However, if I speak about Protestantism in the political sphere, I always also include the um, um, left wing of the Reformation, so always also the Baptists, because they are also, we have worked with them very strong connected, and Baptists are very important partners when it comes to um, human rights and freedom for religion or belief. So that's. Um, the concept so it's different when i speak about person churches in the theological sphere i normally mean the mainline churches that are members of cpce if i speak about protestantism in um, political or ethical questions we, i speak about um, also the organized um, um, protestant churches like baptist um, not all the evangelical churches, which are not organized, which have on a European level the effect, the International Federation of Free Evangelical Churches, but it's not on a European level really, it's an international level. The Baptists have also the um, European Baptist Federation. With the Anglicans, um, it's difficult um, when it comes, for instance, to the um, religious education at the European schools. Um, we also have to deal for them, for the Anglican churches, um, the curricula of the European church schools, but um, normally they don't consider themselves as Protestants. Um, to last about the organization, so we have currently 95 member churches, so for several mergers in the last 50 years, it's from these 909 churches that who signed the law and agreement, now they became 95 churches and they gather all six years for a general assembly. The last was in Basel and in 2018 the next will be in Sibiu, Romania in 2024. So they elect a council 
consisting of 13 members and the council elects a presidium of consisting of three people. Um, these three people at the moment are um, John Bradbury from the United Reformed Church in Great Britain, Miriam Rose, a professor in Jena, Germany, and Marcin Proska, um, pastor in Treschen in Poland. And then we have the head office. So you see Oliver Engelhardt and Markus Hütter, they're working at the head office. So we are six people all together working at the head office. And then we have a lot of different working groups, study groups, advisory boards who work voluntarily for the CPCE. And that is, so the, the core of our work is done in these um, working groups and study groups on a voluntary basis. I hope that's enough just for, to give a short overview. Thank you very much. Um, are there other questions in the meanwhile? Yeah, um, Mr. Lacroix. Oh, thank you. I have a question for Mr. Fitcher too. So, uh, yeah, uh, do you have maybe like with all the shrinking numbers of church members and yeah, like the church is becoming smaller in the countries, is there maybe in the future some possible project of like a big Protestant European, maybe English speaking church? or are like the national differences and maybe the differences between the churches themselves so big that it wouldn't be possible on like a bigger level than like cooperation conferences, schooling, or like a, a real, maybe real big church, if, if something like that's ever been possible. Yeah. So there was already a question from Mr. Heil before. Um, whether there's a European synod. Um, because a lot of European churches consider a synod as the point where it's the focus point of the church. And we have, but we have some churches who haven't a synod or have a different understanding of synod. So the Church of Denmark has only the parliament, not a synod, to decide on these questions because it's a state church. And in the early O years, it was discussed often about the European Synod, but it was denied. So every discussion, every um, topic that was um, agreed on at the General Assembly has to be um, received in the National Synods or in the, in the Member Church Synods. So that's this situation that at the beginning it was, these were autonomous churches who came together and it was unity in reconciled diversity. Let's stay autonomous as we are and do something together. I think it changed now in the last years. It became more the understanding that we are to, together church. We also um, um, published now our last um, doctrinal conversation about church communion, where it, and we were not able to enter with a sentence as communion of churches, we are one church. Now it's written, as communion of reform of churches, we are, we are to church together. That's what's possible, because a lot of churches, um, we are afraid to lose their um, power. The other questions about um, a single church with one language, that will not happen anymore, because I already told you that um, Protestantism is always linked to national languages and cultures. And it's important as well that um, people can pray in their own language, that people can sing in their own language. And we can also see in the European context, it's not necessary to have um, these, um, how they are called, um, foreign congregations. So we, many, many churches have foreign congregations, the Germans in other countries, the Hungarians in other countries, the Dutch people, and also the, all the Scandinavian churches. That would not be, it hasn't, would not be necessary in the situation that 
um, they're already accepted in the person church where they live. They need their own language. They need their own ways to celebrate Christmas. Therefore, they also go to this um, foreign congregations. And I think it's also important because maybe you will also pray in the language which was which you learned maybe from your grandmother or from your grandparents. And I think that's important. And we see it as well with people who lived for years and years abroad when they're then in a retirement house and they like to pray, they pray again in their mother's tongue, in the language of their childhood. Yeah. I, th I know that it's on an organizational level, not as um not yeah yeah we would hope to have if more uh, of the younger generation we would like to we are feeling as a europeans and we would like to have a stronger um, organizational level as well for the churches I'd like to add uh, two aspects, even though you didn't ask me, uh, but nobody asked me the thing, so uh, I, I tried to take this one. Um, so there is a project that is pretty interesting in Brussels called the Chapelle pour l'Europe, uh, Chapel for Europe. Um, and there, uh, every week on, on, on Thursdays, um, there is one <clears throat> short service by, by several confessions, so um, could be Lutheran, Catholic, Orthodox, and so on. And um, each time when, when we started to, so I went there when, when I was in Brussels too, and each time we started to pray our father, everybody started in the mother tongue. Um, so that was pretty interesting, um, but that was a, a very particular project in this um, particular environment of Brussels um, that was somehow kind of a, of a European Christian um, church. Um, and there is another project that could be interesting, but for now it's not working so well, I would say, but there is um, an organization named uh, European Christian Convention, and they try to organize something like a bigger assembly, um, ecumenical on a European level. Up to now, they, they are facing many challenges, but the idea is basically, if, if you know the, the German Kirchentag, so which is like a, a, a very movement-like meeting uh, where um, several church affiliated people can meet and discuss what they would like to and pray and sing together, they would like to establish something similar on a European level, but uh, for now, um, <clears throat> there is no date on which they would like to do that. Well, finally, I um, really have a question to you, Mr. May. As you said, uh, Protestants, uh, Protestant social ethics um, has to work harder. Um, and I, if I understood you right, um, you said it uh, should be on the level on the congregations as well, not only on, on top of the um, on top of the church uh, leaders um, and my question is if there is a coherence with um, the interest of the uh, congregations I only uh, can look at the German context but they are very self um, referential at the moment they look at their, their own and look at their financial resources and um, uh, are very probably because they are diminishing and lose on relevance and so on. And I think this is not a, a good um, basis for uh, social ethics and to look beyond the border of the own congregation. What do you think? Yes, uh, so I think, um, well, this problem of self referential work uh, definitely exists. Um, what is interesting is that um, when, when you take um, like handbooks on, on ethics, it's, it pretty often happens that 
either in the in the preface or in the conclusion they say Europe is somehow important. So um, it's 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 an article about let's say economy and justice and so on, and um, they they always push it away somehow because they know how complicated it turns when you get more into the material questions. Um, so this is a problem indeed. Um, I think, um, or, or what I'm dreaming of is, is, is also to, to foster groups like these and um, to, to develop a better understanding also between the, the different ethical traditions in Europe. Um, so, and, and what is very strange, I think, is that um, in the, let's say, in the beginning of the 20th century, the understanding of the Scandinavian context was a lot better than it is now. So our world got a lot more globalized and Europeanized. And at the same time, um, at least in Germany, but um, in, in other contexts also somewhat, they, they started to, to reflect more and more um, their own tradition and they, they started to work more and more historical, which is a strange dynamic, I, I think. Um, it is different in the, in the Anglo-Saxon context, I would say. Um, but there it is rather the, the global south uh, they are focused on. So um, I would say um, what, what is good also about the school of, of public theology is that they have a lot more understanding about the, the American, the Southern African, the Brazilian, the Korean context. Um, <clears throat> what I'm still missing is that, um, yeah, also national traditions and differences on, on ethical thought um, is a part of ethical reflection. This is um, missing some, somehow, and this would contribute um, to, uh, to a better understanding. And yeah, when it comes to congregation, um, one phenomenon that is, um, that is very interesting is that um, many pro-European Christians I, I met were pretty closely connected to, uh, to the community of Tizé. Um, so uh, for instance, Philippe Lambert, he's uh, the, the speaker of the European Greens, He's from Belgium, and twice a year he goes to Tizé, and um, I, I heard sim similar stories as well. And what is interesting about Tizé is that they um, define themselves um, by non-defining themselves. So it is really a place in which you're meeting, but you're not reflecting openly somehow. Or of course you reflect, but there is no doctrine, which is also, I think, uh, the, um, the success of Tizé, that you simply meet there. Um, and uh, maybe we, we need something, <clears throat> yeah, something beyond. This is what, what I actually hope for. Um, and the other way around, we also have to face that um, the European Union, um, even though they, they got a little more open to religion, um, they, they still have a burden of, of secularism. And um, I, I also experienced that when, when I try to um, to get, uh, well, to get research funds. Um, and it's pretty hard uh, for, for a theological department to get uh, research funds from the European Union. Um, so I think also they should move a bit and um, give space to, to religion as a part of the public sphere. Thank you very much. Hello. And I, I think that um, maybe, um, um goal to look for um way to act like Taze and find ways to uh, go beyond the borders and i like to return to my uh, uh, words about um a republic because uh, i think it's even a the question of the words we use for things and have to look for um, models and the way we describe models that opens uh, for the possibility of um, going beyond the borders that make thinking and the living very close. And um, when I look at the clock now, I see the time is already running out. It's short after eight o'clock. Um, are there any more questions?
otherwise I'd like to thank you all, especially our lectures for today, Mario Fischer and Lucas Meyer um, for your lectures and for the answers to our question. I'd like to thank you all for participating on the Digital Academy and I'm looking forward uh, the next time and I uh, like to give a small look out for the next lecture. Um, it's, uh, on 18th of November, we will have uh, the topic, the variety of Christian identities in ecumenical perspectives. It was mentioned already in the lecture of Mario Fischer. It's about the construction of identity in the in regional societies and regional communities and uh, um, coherence of national and um, confessional um, relationship. Um, you have the possibility to evaluate the lecture on the, our homepage, uh, young-theology.eu. Um, and you can tell things you have liked and um, ideas what we should make better. Um, as I said, I'm looking forward to next time and I hope you will join us again on the Digital Academy. And now I'd like to say have a nice evening and thank you very much again. <laughs>